Greetings, Ventures. This is Lorne, your guild advisor, and welcome back to this week's installment of Cuts and Changes for Damachi 4, where I highlight the differences between the original light novel source and the anime adaption, as well as provide additional context for what you see in the show. With episode 11, we have now reached the finale for the first half of season 4. The Juggernaut is still alive, while Bell and Ryu are in incredibly poor condition, trapped within the deep floors of the dungeon. With the Juggernaut leaving the floor while adventurers still remain in the water capital, the Monster Rex of the area, Amphis Bina, has responded early, the banquet of tragedy still unending. There are some great moments in this final episode of the core, but as always there are some finer details you'll want to know. Let's start the breakdown. After the minute and a half recap, Ryu runs to aid Belle and she discovers that the Goliath Scarf saved them from certain death. She tears off a piece of her cape to help stop the bleeding from Belle's severed arm and uses her magic, Noah Heal, to recover Belle's likely fractured neck. Her healing magic has the ability to heal surface wounds and other damage, but unlike a potion which works instantly, her magic requires a bit of time to take effect. While Ryu is waiting for the magic, she is conflicted, because she wants to immediately help Bors and the other adventurers. I noted in the previous Cuts and Changes video that Belle actually stopped Juggernaut in time to save the Amazon girl and other members he was acquainted with in the light novel but it's in this moment where they would have died anyway. Also, Jura's dialogue about wishing Belle would die faster is anime original and likely just a way to remind you that he's still around. After confirming that Belle's condition is stabilized, Ryu rushes in to help Bors' party. As she fights the source of her despair, she recalls the depths of her familia in her memories, and she shouts out loud to drown out her own fear. In the end, her weapon Olive's Lumina is shattered by the Juggernaut's claws of destruction. This is a rather special sword, as it was a gift from a close friend of hers, but if you want to find out more about the sword's origins, look into the Estrella Record story event from the Damachi mobile game Don Memo, which tells a story involving Ryu and the Estrella Familia from seven years in the past. The story is being rewritten into a light novel series, which starts releasing next month in Japan, but there's currently no news of an official English release. While Ryu distracts Juggernaut, Bors and his party combine the blasts from their magic weapons into a single concurrent bombardment. Just like with Bell's Firebolt, Juggernaut is able to reflect the blast, turning the adventurers except for Bors into charred corpses. I'm not sure why Bors is almost completely unharmed in the anime adaption. In the light novel, Bors was in the back of the party, so he did not suffer a direct hit. But his eye patch was burned off, so his empty eye socket was exposed. It's incredibly strange because one single firebolt caused Bell's armor to come off in the anime, but the combined blast of multiple magic weapons didn't do any visible damage to Bors at all. When Bors is about to be killed by Juggernaut, he is actually hallucinating his own death, imagining his body being split in half and head crushed. But just like in the anime, he is saved by Ryu at the last moment. Ryu continues to defend Bors as her hood comes down causing Bors to verify that the gale wind that he was hunting was indeed the same adventurer who helped the dungeon Tana Rivera fight off against the Black Goliath. With Ov's Lumina destroyed, Ryu opts to fight with her twin Kodachi, named Futaba, which were weapons from a fallen familiar member. Eventually, the Juggernaut uses its tail to snap one of Ryu's legs, making her unable to continue fighting. Ryu laments that she was never able to explain herself to Seer and the rest of the pub workers, but takes solace in being able to be reunited with her fallen familiar members in death. She believed she would finally be free of her guilt, and a smile of resignation was on her lips as a tear fell from her eye. But alas, something caught her attention. As the battle between Ryu and the Juggernaut transpired, Belle's body fell into the water and was found by Mari. She heals him with the power of her mermaid lifeblood, even using the Hestia knife to release enough blood to restore his entire body. When the Divine Knife is in the hands of someone not in Hestia Familia, the knife becomes dull. But give it enough force, you can still puncture skin. When the knife is reunited with Belle's hand, you can see the glyphs on the Hestia Knife glow as the blade comes back to life. When Ryu sees Belle come back into the scene, she actually watches him burst out of the water in the light novel, with a determined look in his eyes. The illustration for Belle in the novel is incredibly intense as well, though I do want to say I love the wet hair look he has in the anime. When Bell races into battle, the light novel describes him like a speeding bullet, but you don't exactly get that sense of speed in the anime. Bell wraps his left arm in the Glide Scarf to use as a shield. It's a bit easier to understand how he came to this conclusion because as I mentioned during cuts and changes for episode 10, 
he tried to use his left arm protector to defend against the Juggernaut's claws, but that plan failed with his armor becoming shattered. Realizing that the scarf protected him from death, he opts to utilize the scarf made from the defensive properties of the Black Goliath. It was a match between the ultimate defense created by the dungeon and the claws of destruction birthed by the dungeon. The scarf that Cassandra and Welk created became Bell's lifeline. When Bell notes that the Juggernaut has no magic stone, it means that he would not be able to target a specific spot on the Juggernaut, like he would with a traditional monster, in order to destroy it instantly, as destroying a magic stone causes a monster to turn to ash. There is a sequence in the anime version of this fight that is slightly difficult to understand. You can see Bell hitting the legs of the Juggernaut and hear sounds like he's driving his weapon against metal. What I believe the anime is trying to convey is that at one point in the novels, Bell takes out one of the Juggernaut's reverse knee joints, which allows it to jump at incredible speed. This is why Bell later states that he stopped it from being able to jump around. The novel specifically mentions Bell cutting into the right knee joint with the Juggernaut's leg dropping with a loud thump, but this moment is never properly conveyed in the anime. There are a lot of high-speed clashes between Bell and the Juggernaut in the light novel, but they aren't really showcased that much in the anime adaption. I think the overall form of the Juggernaut makes it a bit challenging to animate a fight versus the more humanoid form of the Minotaur from Season 1, but I do believe there are still creative ways to overcome that when it comes to animation. As Bell and Juggernaut are exchanging blows, Bell is constantly getting scratched and punctured, but never takes a direct hit. The Hesty Knife and Goliath Scarf were able to withstand the Claws of Destruction, However, it's mentioned in the light novel that Bell's left arm was getting pulverized by the force of the claws. Blood could be felt sloshing around inside the wrapping of the scarf. Despite the pain from his arm streaming at him, Bell reminds himself of why he's there. In the anime, he mentions needing to defeat Juggernaut, so it can't go after Lily and the other adventurers, but it leaves out the direct thoughts he has in the novels. He specifically proclaims that he had to go on for her sake, for Ryu's sake. After all, the whole reason he was there in the first place was to help her. As Ryu watches, she realizes just who Belle was fighting for. In response, there was a hotness that started to grow in her chest. She began to understand why Belle loved the tales of heroes so much. She was witnessing the image of a hero facing off against despair. As the battle continued, Belle's spirit started dominating the juggernauts, causing it to retreat from close combat. This is when Belle thinks to Asterius and Eyes, Two warriors he knew would never retreat. He sees this moment to enact his reckless plan. He shoots his firebolt at the Juggernaut, 17 consecutive shots in the light novel, and plans to use the magic reflection as both a cover fire and a way to charge his finishing move, Argo Vesta. As Bell gets closer to the Juggernaut, the monster struggles with what to do, as it didn't know what Argo Vesta was. A physical attack or a magic one? Should it defend with its magic shell or its claws? Instead, the Juggernaut tries to retreat, but Bell pulls the monster in by grappling onto the Juggernaut with the Goliath Scarf. The anime doesn't showcase this exact moment, but Argo Vesta collides with the claws of the Juggernaut, destroying its right arm, Bell getting revenge for his own. You can later see the Juggernaut's right arm no longer attach in the next scene. It wasn't very clear in the light novel in regards to how Jura put the magic collar around Juggernaut, but I appreciated the Pokeball-like way in which it was thrown. Jira shouts his order to kill Bell and Ryu and is unceremoniously split in half, the Juggernaut resisting the magic item. However, as Bell observes, the still-alive Lantern was dutifully following the command. The Lantern remaining alive may seem odd to an anime-only viewer because normally in the anime adaption, when monsters are killed, they turn into ash, so someone would have surely noticed the body was still there. However, Monsters will only turn into ash when their magic stone is destroyed in the light novel, meaning most defeated monsters leave behind corpses like you see with the Lampton. The monster swallows up Bell and Ryu and burrows down into the dungeon with the Juggernaut following after them. With the Juggernaut now gone from the water capital and the adventurers which the dungeon considers viruses still inside, the dungeon does the unthinkable and respawns the monster wrecks of the water capital two weeks early. The Amphis Bina is a special floor boss as it can climb the waterfalls of the water capital, meaning it can travel multiple floors unlike other floor bosses. The expedition party has their work cut out for them, much to the dismay of Cassandra, who has been trying her hardest to prevent tragedy from happening. Speaking of tragedy, 
We go back to the Lambton, which finally stops burrowing, landing in a dark and white surface floor. In the novels, Belle is actively trying to get out of the Wormwell while it is moving, and when he finally breaks through with Firebolt, the Lambton crashes into the ground. Belle cuts the body open with the Hestia knife and pulls apart the opening with his hands. He gets himself and Ryu out of the monster's body, their clothes tattered and bodies burned by the stomach acid of the monster. If Bell and Ryu were not level 4 adventurers, they would have likely melted into a puddle inside the monster. As Bell observes his surroundings, he thinks back to a conversation with Aina, realizing that they were in an area known as the White Palace on floor 37. They were stranded and injured inside the deep floors. Interesting fact, but the floor boss that is found on floor 37, the Udeus, is a monster rex that I spot by herself to become level 6. Bell and Ryu are now a long way from safety, and the Juggernaut is still out there. What seemed like a bad situation for a character's last episode just turned into an even worse one. I think the ending light novel illustration perfectly displays the fear in Bell's eyes as he's surrounded by darkness. Rough cliffhanger to end on while we wait for part 2 of season 4 in January. Overall, I think this final episode of The Core did a good job in regards to building up the helplessness that both the Expedition Party and Belle feel at the end of the episode. I thought the final sequence with Argo Vesta was done well, but I will be lying if I said I wasn't a tiny bit disappointed with the overall fight between Belle and the Juggernaut. It felt like it needed just a few more touches to give off that same intensity that the light novels had, but I'll reserve those criticisms for my episode 10 and 11 review, which I'll release later. The Don Memo side story for this week actually adapts a scene from volume 14 of the light novel, but it's Bell remembering a conversation he had with Eyes concerning the deep levels, so it's not much of a spoiler. Though it makes me wonder if this scene will be skipped in part 2 of season 4 since it's appearing in the mobile game. Anyway, that concludes part 1 of season 4 as well as cuts and changes until part 2 comes back next year. If for some reason the cliffhanger is killing you and you want to continue the story right away, you can start from volume 14 to pick up immediately where the episode left off. I'll be continuing to make Damaji content as we wait for part 2, and a lot of it will be focused on covering content to make your experience with part 2 more enjoyable. I plan to cover characters that will become more relevant as well as touch upon Estrella Familia, so please look forward to more Damaji content on the channel in the near future. As always, if you found this video informative, please give the video a like and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to follow me on my socials and this is Lorne, your guild advisor, signing out.